All right. And we are on CSL Princeton. Thank you, John. John Heron figured it out. And we're all set. Yes. So there we are. And I am waiting for someone out there in the virtual world to let me know that you are here. Also, um, those of you who have received treatment gifts, uh, cash them in. <laughs> cash them in. I'm getting some from some of you, but uh, not everyone. And so we are hanging out here. Moving forward. Onward. Okay, two people are here. Hello, Margaret and David. Okay, so you two have won. And um, I will do spiritual work for each of you, if you let me know. Text me for what you would like. That would be great. I know you know how to text me. So that is very good. And we're ready to go. They're here. And we're here. For what should I treat? Clarity? Peace. Peace. Okay. Clarity, harmony, clarity. You only get to say one. <laughs> oh, you are limited. <laughs> Everybody only gets to say one. <laughs> okay, I got a love, I got a clarity, I got a peace, and... Abundance. Abundant, totally different <laughs> one. Okay. Abundance. Okay, good. All right, and out there, I gave you a little time in case anybody types something in, but feel free to type something in, and if I open my eye while I'm treating, I'll include that too. All right, so this word is being spoken for each one. And if there's anyone you would like to have included, just think of their name now. Or any place on the planet, any situation in the world that you would like to have the presence of God be recognized. Just think of that place now, that situation, and know that this word includes all of that. One mind. One mind. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow, only one mind. That mind is all that is, just as much now as it was at the beginning of all creation. All that mind that was present at the birthing of each one onto this planet is present now. Nothing has changed about this mind. It is fresh, it is new, and it is forever knowing itself. It never gets tired or never starts fraying at the ends when it thinks I am that I am. It is always a divine declaration, continuously known and continuously expressing itself in new form. That I am that I am is a cosmic verity. And that I am that I am is forever creating an expression of itself. And in every nano moment, a brand new, fresh, clean, clear expression of itself is extended, projected into form. And so this is continuous. This is the way it is and it has never changed and it will never change. And so no matter what might be going on in anyone's personal thinking or what one might consider their own personal mind, the truth is it is the mind of God that is thinking. It is the mind of God that knows I am that I am that is being thought right now. And the, it is the divine's thought of I am that I am, that is the cause right now for the expression of each one. I am that I am with all of its power, with all of its vitality and all of its qualities. It is that divine knowing that is the knowing creating each one. So any personal belief in a separated mind, any personal or human race thoughts about what happens to the mind or to the brain or to thoughts, all boring thoughts, all belief that one is stuck with particular thoughts, all belief that one is a victim of 
past thoughts, past old tapes, past voices in one's head, or uh, all beliefs in um, ruts and and habits of and and deep grooves in the brain of mental thinking. All those beliefs are not the truth because and 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 none of that even if evidenced in some sort of petri dish somewhere it is not affecting the knowing of the divine knower knowing i am that i am i am that i am fresh new full of vitality and always crystal clear of its knowing. I am that I am. And so down to the very detail that divine mind is knowing. And so each one is right now having within the consciousness of thought that is each one is having this divine knower knowing I am that I am with all of its clarity, with all of its harmony and peace with all of its knowing of itself. And it is this divine thinker present in thought, in thinking right now, right here, in through and as each one that is now guiding each one with that crystal clarity. Each one is able to tune in to that divine thought wave present within them and hear it crystal clear in fact, that tuning into the divine is so strong, it is so loud, it is so present that all other frequencies are erased, vanished, gone, irrelevant. Each one is seeing and hearing and listening to and guided by that divine I am that I am that is present within them. And in this, divine self-knowing, this divine self-contemplation, each one is receiving it, hearing it in still a unique way, which is the way that the divine is knowing itself to be in creating each one. It is the divine acting, operating, being in, through, and as each one. This is present now. It's not, it doesn't need to be encouraged. It doesn't need to be asked for. It doesn't need to be earned. It's there, right here and right now. And each one is now tuned in and therefore with crystal clarity, the clarity of that one mind, that divine knower, each one knows that truth and how to particularly express it in his or her life in his or her world, how to bring that divine creator's activity through in and as him or herself and co-create a world that is expressing the divine's perfect peace and harmony, its love, and to express this great and glorious life, to have it, to accept it, to express it, and to have it more abundantly to be as that divine thinker is heard in a clearer and more clearer, more and more powerful way, the abundance of good that is present is received, demonstrated and manifested in all directions, 360 degrees around each one, spherically around each one. Each one is centered each one is at the core, the divine I am that I am. And each one is at that center of that which is turning, that center which is not turning, that center which is changeless, that center which is that very presence of the great I, the great I am. And in this point of view, at this level of perspective, everything that is expressed everywhere is seen with clarity for what it is, recognized what it is, acknowledged where it came from. And each one at that center claims 
that power of choice to choose how to alter that which is expressed in his or her world. And each one is choosing that expression in a more harmonious, in a more loving, in a more grace-filled, an easier, a freer way than ever before. There are no regrets. There is nothing holding anyone back. There is nothing in the past that is good enough for anyone here and now. That which is past is not in the I am sight. The I am is now, here, expressing itself, here, now. And with all that it is present, there is no need for, for anything from the past to be kept, <laughs> to be present, to, there are no necessary steps to experience that which anyone desires to experience when one is centered in that great I am here now because all this universe is arranged around the center the I am and as each one is centered in the center everything in his or her world is orderly harmoniously rearranged in perfect right order in divine right action each one is seeing the divine order manifested in his or her world and it comes from being centered in the center of all life all love all peace all good and here there is joy and here there is love and here in the center each one is looking out of all that is expressed in his or her world and loving his or her life completely. This is the truth here and now. It is already known by that divine thinker and each one is now tuned into that thought and therefore is in agreement with it and is knowing that which it knows on every level of his or her human nature being expression this is good each one is prospered healthier happier wealthier and enjoying this experience of life with grace and with ease in a better way than ever before i am grateful that this is truth and so i now release this word to the loving law grateful <sighs> that it is that divine i am that i am at the center of all that is the cause of it all and so it is done, and so it is. And we've multiplied. <laughs> we've multiplied. Oh, okay, David, got your got your treatment request. Hello, Deborah. Good to see you. And yes, it's our practitioner's birthday, Deja Winter, who's not here. She's off having her birthday, but happy birthday, Deja. All right. And oh, my cousin's here. Hi, Tammy. <laughs> my cousin all right enough we are family we're moving forward Reverend Rich take some music here I am opening I am opening my heart is ready to see I am opening, I am opening, my heart is ready to see I am opening, I am opening, my heart is ready to receive. So let's take a moment, go into your heart, which is connected to that universal heart, the heart of God. And right there, whatever it is that you desire to experience through this meeting this morning or in your life, wherever it is, healing, demonstration, some new wonderful good, whatever it is, forgiveness, release, whatever it is, just realize that that's what your heart desires and don't say no to it. 
Just recognize that's what my heart wants and shut up about it. That's what my heart wants. Just let it be there, lay it there on the table and let now the truth that is expressed in this meeting through the musicians, the speakers, the practitioners, let the consciousness of all those who are here everywhere that it is know the truth and see how you are lifted up and your good, if that desire in the heart is fulfilled. Let's be grateful for this activity that starts now and let it go to the law saying together, and so it is. I am opening, I am opening, my heart is ready to receive, I am opening, I am opening, my heart is ready to receive. <laughs> good morning, good morning. Welcome to Center for Spiritual Living Princeton. My name is Regina Quinston. I am one of the licensed practitioners here at this wonderful center. Uh, thank you, Reverend Karen, for your wonderful meditation. And thank you, Reverend Rich, for your musical expertise that you share with us each Sunday, so thank you. And um, I also want to say happy birthday to my grandson, Darian, who is 16, and my other grandson will be 16 tomorrow, one day apart, different families, <laughs> one day apart, so that's wonderful. Um, and also, um, let's just take a moment and go within, contemplating the peace within, because the peace within, getting centered and grounded in it, is what out pictures in our world, in our country, and in the countries all around us. So let's take a moment. Thank you. I almost thought that was the um, <laughs> some more breathing in there. My um, <laughs> so, peace on earth. Okay. Please go to our Facebook page to see um, what future activities that we're having. Um, that's CSL Space Princeton. So look there for our future activities and because the, they'll be posted there and i'd like to ask how's everyone doing how's everyone doing good yeah good yeah. Mm. <laughs> mm. maybe that's the subject right no regrets okay mm. this mm. oneness 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 um i'm knowing only good for you for each of us out there in here and I will always tell you, those out there, hi, Majid, um, happy birthday, Deja. Um, join us here at the center where we have our services. So I want to just talk to you a little bit about my reading. The last time I did the welcome, I was talking about Eric Butter Butterworth's Spiritual economics. I'm still going through it. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's my sheet. Um, and this this was or is. Let me maybe put it in the present tense. Um, was a science of mind uh, class that we taught. And when I took it, <laughs> which was some time ago, Reverend Ian Taylor was our instructor, mm -hmm. and we had the class in our office or a classroom or route one. So um, one of the things that was in the announcement for spiritual economics was, or is, this course is created for students interested in ongoing spiritual growth and development. 
So I want to talk to you just as short, well, briefly, as briefly as I talk, um, <laughs> about this chapter that he has, your, fu your fortune begins with you. And he talks about the law of visualization. But two words that he uses in this chapter um, struck me. One was entropy. Anyone know what entropy means? No. Yeah, things have a, ten a tendency to uh, become less yeah. if we don't give them energy to become more. Wait a minute. So it's becoming less. Ah. Things degrade. The other word that I had never known before was centropy. 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 Centropy, innate drive in living matter to perfect itself. To perfect itself. Yeah, centropy. Um, and it just, we, well, did. Believe me, there's a spiritual coordination that's going on here, you know, at our center as oneness um, uh, out pictures in our experience. Reverend Karen has been talking about the kingdoms, kingdom one, kingdom two, kingdom three. And when you go through and begin to apply the kingdoms, is that not centropy? Is that not bettering yourself? Bettering your consciousness? Evolving into something greater than you may presently be experiencing? So it was interesting that I encountered this word. So let me share some of the things that uh, Eric Butterworth talks about. Um, in regards to this. One of the things he says, when you are in charge of your mind in the consciousness of oneness, we've heard of oneness today, with the creative flow, when you are working with life instead of against it, when you are positive and loving and secure in the conviction of truth, then you are under what he calls the white cloud. You are living. The white cloud is you are living a charmed life. It is nothing more nor less than consciousness outforming itself. More. The answer is in your conditioned ability to form and shape the ever-present substance of the universe. You can change your, now he uses the word luck, and I cross that out in my book, and I throw, you can change your condition to something better. That's the evolution. Don't let the world around you force you into its mold but let God remold your mind from within. So we must go with a must, but your choice is to go within, to outpicture that which you want to experience. He also says, believing is seeing. You see things not as they are, but as you are. Think about that. Not as, wait a minute, let me go back. Believing is seeing, you see things not as they are, but as you are. Your perception is shaped according to your previous experiences, according to your faith, according to where you are in consciousness. And here we go into the law of visualization to see it rightly. 
changing things out there is changing the way you see them. Changing the way you see them. Thomas Troward says, having seen and felt the end, you have willed the means to the realization of the end. Having seen and felt the end, you have willed means to the realization of the end. So in your visualization, when you take within that view, right seeing, and you feel it, that's when the guidance of the unfolding comes and you will achieve now I had a good time doing this. This this was fun for me. I was giggling. I was, you know, because I'm I'm visualizing and I'm out picturing and I'm giggling and I'm feeling it. So I know it's going to be. I don't know exactly how it's going to outline because I don't outline. But I know it is, and that's good enough. So let's end this with. You have actually created the condition in mind that makes a particular result inevitable. The result is inevitable. It is fundamental law. So what I invite you to do is have a centrop centropic, centrific, consciousness <laughs> develop it a centrific consciousness go within contemplate and then feel it happening at the end that it is done and then watch how you're guided to that formation. That's manifestation. That's demonstration. Enjoy. Okay. Thank you. I'm <laughs> 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 uh, sort of on the same lines. Now. I had a boat named Entropy. Oh, no. Which was That's not good. <laughs> perfect. Yeah, well, it demonstrated entropy to me on a regular basis. Because oh. <laughs> it took more and more energy to keep that sailboat from descending into chaos. And I was going to change the name of it because I didn't know what entropy meant. When I, there's, there's two different definitions for entropy. It's, it's a term of the Amex thing, too. But and after I sailed for a while, I said, hmm, I'm going to keep the name. <laughs> and it's entropy is the P-Y versus the H-Y at the end. Huh? I My boat was entropy. Mola, Mola, the angels are calling, the angels are calling, Hosanna, Mola, 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 the angels are calling, the angels are calling, Hosanna. Joy, more joy, more joy. The angels are calling. The angels are calling. Oh, God, more joy, more joy, more joy. The angels are calling. The angels are calling. Oh, God, more joy, more life. More life, more life, the angels are calling, the angels are calling, oh, it's more life. So, I am the practitioner today. Thanks a lot. So, uh, I've been thinking about, you know, uh, demonstrations and 
Thank you for the direction. <laughs> I've been thinking I don't like being here. Okay. So, but anyway, um, <laughs> thank you for uh, for telling me what to do. Um, and I lost my train of thought. So I was thinking about demonstrations, and I was thinking about, you know, how often I doubt this thing that we call science of mind. And and I've had some incredible demonstrations over the years, and I and I just wonder why in the world, how in the world, can I not in every moment of my life absolutely believe this thing? Because I have absolutely had incredible demonstrations of my own life. I've seen them. I've seen tumors disappear. Not in me, but in other people. I've seen all kinds of crazy things happen. And there's no reason for them to happen, but they happen. And the only reason they happened was because someone saw that to happen, and someone brought their consciousness into being for that to happen. So that's uh, my, uh, that's my, uh, my daily practice every day, is to see beyond the physical, to see the metaphysical, to see beyond the clouds when you're an airplane and you take off and it's a cloudy day and you, you climb and you climb and climb and you get through the clouds and it's a beautiful, beautiful blue sky. And it, it's always been there. It's always there. And, and I try to see my reality like that, that there is, there is nothing that can't be accomplished by this law by this life, by this thing that we call God, for lack of another word. And, and my practice, uh, when I, my day isn't going, I don't see my day going the way, would be th the best way for it to go. I will see that happening. I will see clearly, and, it's, and I, even my visualization is even coming out of the clouds, and knowing that there is a reality a reality, capital R, beyond reality, capital, small, small letter R, small case R. And, um, and more times than not, it happens just like that. Like, it's the impossible. Something impossible will come about. Uh, so these are words from How to Use the Science of Mind by Ernest Holmes. And I invite you to Put your feet flat on the floor if you feel like it. And, you know, take a deep breath. Become receptive. And here's what Ernest had to say about this. Spiritual mind practice is the very essence of faith. It is the essence of conviction. An act of assurance. A complete surrender of the will to a willingness to believe a complete abandonment of thought to the invisible. But the practitioner adds law to his faith and spiritual principles to their religion. They add a conscious use of the law of mind to their conviction of the presence of spirit. In doing this, they bring the personal to bear on the impersonal, which is principle, while at the same time uniting their consciousness with the peace, the poise, the power, the beauty, and the wisdom which the spirit must be. Just as they know that the law of the harvest will provide a crop, so they know that the law of good will execute their word. The law is automatic and self-operative. The practitioner is not using divine mind to overcome a carnal mind. They are using a harmonious thought to overcome a discordant mental atmosphere. The basis of their work lies in the assumption that we are now living in a spiritual universe. There you go. That we are now living in a spiritual universe. I'm going to say it again. We are now living in a spiritual universe that the law of our being is the law of mind and action, that there is an exact parallel between thoughts and things. The practitioner must believe that the movement of mind acts as a movement of law, 
if they state in a treatment that their word is the law of elimination to a congested condition, they must believe that the congested condition is automatically eliminated through the law of their word. In the mind of the practitioner, there should be no difference between stating this word is the law of elimination and the elimination which should follow such statement. So I speak my word. I speak it knowing that there is one universal law, that there is one universal power, that, and that this power is good and it acts only as good. And I also state that everyone here, that everyone is, is, is participating in the service, whether they're, they're present in this room or are present outside and are listening in, that we are all completely enveloped in this mind and in this reality. So I speak my word knowing that there can only be good resulting from, from this service, from the celebration of life. I know for each one here that they are easily able to move their thoughts into a, a place of conscious connectivity, to, to know that they are enveloped in that mind and that their thoughts will demonstrate as their thought. So I give thanks to that which, which moves us. I give thanks to that indwelling spirit. I give thanks knowing that, that the word spoken as it has been spoken must demonstrate and that only good can result from this. And I'm releasing it to love by saying, and so it is. And so, so it is. is. And I'll move back over here. <laughs> <laughs> I think for all of us here in the, in the Center for Spiritual Living, Princeton, uh, know that big things are coming and that something's calling us. We don't quite know what it is yet. We're going to find it. Something's calling me. Something's calling me. Something's calling me a little bit deeper than I've ever been before. I feel like I'm walking on marble. Can't feel the earth beneath my feet. My head in the clouds, my naked legs left dangling. I can feel my heart beginning to pound. Somebody said, Something's calling me a little bit deeper than I've ever been before. Something's calling me. Never been before. Long dark night, my soul in wonders. Can't see the light that moves me. God is everything and everywhere that I belong. Spirit can wakes me from my sleep. Something's calling me Oh, 
Something's calling me a little bit deeper than I've ever been before. Love keeps calling me a little bit deeper than I've ever been before. Faith keeps calling me a little bit deeper than I've ever been before. Alrighty. All right, so our topic today is no regrets. And um, that's because as we have been um, letting our office space go, not our center go, but we, we've closed our office space. As I touch things and as I go through things, the predominant emotion in me has been regret. And I'm, I, I'm surprised. I didn't like, I didn't think regret is very operative in me, but I realize um, if you don't go through all the stuff you've been keeping, you don't feel the regret that's buried in it. And a lot of the, the things that I had had in our office were minister training sessions, workshops on how to improve, how to speak better, how to be a better leader, how to have a better organization, how to have a better board of trustees, how to have a better, and then you did it that way, now do it this way, and how to, buckets and buckets and buckets of workshops and trainings and professional developments and money I spent to go to all these things and the materials, the binders and binders and binders of stuff that I have. And you come back from these workshops and these trainings and you're like, yes, I'm gonna do this. Yes, I'm gonna do this. Yes, I'm gonna do this. And you all know what happens, right? <laughs> Life greets you upon your return and you set it aside. And before you know it, you are swept away and that gets into the pile of good ideas great ideas, things that I want to do. And so as I'm unearthing these piles, I'm feeling regret. And feeling regret in me feels bad. I don't know, how does regret, anybody here know regret? Okay, we got some people, okay. Does it feel good <laughs> or does it? I mean, it feels really awful and um, so I, uh, I've been facing this regret and uh, talking with good friends of mine who perhaps uh, also have some piles of stuff of, of the past laying around and um, realized many things that might prove helpful to any of you, I don't know. But number one, these piles of really great things that I meant to do something with but got carted off by life. Um, that the regret and all the feelings and the thoughts that I'm having around them are in that pile. But I'm not feeling it if I don't look at the pile. So all these nice little boxes and things that I had stored in the closet and here in the corner and in, in the file cabinet, all those things that uh, the undone, the incomplete, the unresolved, the unfinished, the oh, I mean to, or that's a great idea, all that stuff doesn't feel bad if you keep it buried. But it is blocking you moving forward. Because when you do begin to move forward, you're carrying that stuff with you. In consciousness and for me, in physical form. And so regrets are a way of not dealing with our past, not letting our past go. It's part of coulda, shoulda, woulda, wished I'd 
but it none of that belongs in the now. Does God regret what it did to the dinosaurs? Does it regret making dinosaurs? You know, I, I, I've heard people say that was a big mistake. <laughs> you know, the divine's like, I need something that moves on the planet. Let's try this. Uh, no. Um, so the divine in creating everything, creating this entire universe and everything, it has no unconscious memory of the past. The divine mind does not carry any of the past in its thinking. The divine is in the now, here. I am that I am. That's what the divine knows. Self-contemplation of the divine mind. I am that I am. There is no I was that I was, or I wish that I had been. There's no past, and there's no future in the divine mind. I want to be, or I will be, or I could be, or... No, it's I am now, here, I am that I am. And so, yes, what it has created, it uses as material in creating its now moment. But it's not limited by what it's already created. And... The divine mind does not honor what it already created, right? It just sweeps it off the planet. If it's not part of the now I am that I am. And we human beings, we get disturbed by that natural activity of nature because we're afraid that we're going to get swept off the planet. Um, and maybe we will, but when we start knowing what the divine mind knows, we then are creating our now moment, which becomes our future when our future is our I am moment. But we gotta get really clear, because I think the human race, well, certainly me, is attached to having a past. Attached to having a past. We get disturbed when we lose our memories of the past. Um, we, we give it names of bad things. But when you're fully living in the now, expressing the I am that I am as you are here now, the past has nothing to do with it. And so why would someone like me or some of you think about the past and keep parts of the past that cause you to feel bad alive in your now. That's what I've been looking at. And so I notice that when I felt, as I was going through my all these different trainings and all the different curriculums that I did, whatever, I would have a pile of recycle and I'd have a, a pile of, ooh, gotta keep. And then I would have this other pile of, uh, but I still want to do something with it. Give me another chance. Well, I want to redo, you know, let's, re let's redo whatever. And, and that pile of the redo, give me another chance, is huge. The recycled, it's already gone. And the, oh, got to keep like one piece of paper. You put it in an important folder. It's, got, it's, it's put in a place where it can be used. But the, the cartons of, oh, not ready to let it go is actually saying to me, I'm not ready to feel good. I'm not ready to be free. I'm not ready to be able to dream freely again. I need to carry these cartons around for a while. So we have a storage unit. So. The church, the church has all kinds of cartons, and most of it is certainly the churches or things to things that are being released, blah blah blah. But there is a little, there is a little pile on one side, that's stuff of mine, uh, ministerial related stuff that are good ideas, and in not making the decision to let it go. I'm feeling the regrets, keeping it close. 
So my spiritual practice has been this past week, uh, the, for those of you who've been around, there's a spiritual practice called a releasing prayer, and you insert in it three words, a belief that you want to get rid of, and a behavior that you want to let stop doing, and then you want a God quality that you want instead. And this came from Lloyd Strom and Marsha Sutton, and so my releasing prayer has been, I release my belief in regret. Because actually, it's not that I'm feeling regret, I believe that regrets exist. Like that's a natural part of, li part of life, regret. So I release my belief in regret, and I release my need to feel bad. Apparently, I need to feel bad as I let things go. Or so let's keep them so we can feel bad. You know what I mean? And then I am grateful God is the freedom, the freedom that I am. Because when I'm believing in regrets and I'm not, and I'm feeling bad, I'm not free. And so I'm inviting freedom to move in. And so... I remember uh, one of my favorite movies last holiday, uh, Queen Lativa said, um, a politician said to her, he missed, a, he missed a meeting in her community and uh, she called him on it and he said, oh, well, will you please give them my regrets? And Queen Lativa said, I got enough of my own regrets. I'm not taking yours. <laughs> you give your own regrets. And there was one box, one carton of stuff, and Jeff was with me, uh, our very, very last day. The landlord's coming at 2 o'clock for the keys, and I'm sitting there in the, this empty office, no furniture, no chairs. I'm sitting on the floor on the, this brand-new carpeting because the whole thing got redone because of the flood, right? And I've got this huge carton in front of me, and, I'm, and, I, and I confess to Jeff, I can't let it go. I can't let this go. I can't let this go. And he's, he's very gentle. Who knows what he said? But he said stuff to me. And I'm like, just like, I was just sitting over the carton, feeling all the feelings that were going through me. And what it was was a carton of junior school materials, curriculum. That when I first came here, we had some people who emerged pretty pretty quickly bright creative dynamic uh, people they became practitioners who built a junior school built an incredible junior school and I have in my home and we actually still had in the office uh, the evidence of the activity of the junior school because every once in a while the, all the children and the teachers would make me a little gift and so I would get something with all their signatures all scrawled on it in some sort of crafty kind of ink. Um, you know, and these things I just treasure. But this particular box was curriculum. It was a whole lot of their materials that they used. And to me, it was valuable. It could be used again. But no one wants it. And it's not being used. And it's just filled with regret, it's over. I couldn't let it go until, I guess Jeff was treating and saying some clear things to me, but there was a, uh, there was a certain point when all of a sudden I felt myself separate from it and I thought, wait a minute, yeah, it is filled with regret, but it's not my regret. It's the people who did this, that they did this, they created this wonderful thing and then they were guided to leave and they left and they left this behind. And it, it, it's, it wasn't mine to feel regret over. And, and then in, in that realization, I actually felt free. Oh, okay, now I know what to do with this. At the same time, my mom made her transition a number of years ago, and I inherited a very expensive object of hers that was given to her as a gift. And I was present when she received the gift. And she, I didn't understand what the situation was with her, but in receiving the gift, she was trying to hold back sobs 
of sadness and grief. And I'm like, it's Christmas. You know, be happy. Look, this is a great gift. You know, whatever. And she's just, to her, it was full of pain. So I have that object. And I've been, what do I do with it? What do I do with it? It's an expensive object. And I could give it here. I could give it there. Oh, I could have it remade into something. I could do all these things with it. All these really great ideas have come to me. And I'm unable to do anything with it. And in that moment, in that moment, in that, on Monday, in the office about the junior school curriculum, I realized that object came into my mind and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's my mother's regrets is in that object, not mine. That wasn't my life that felt that pain. And something in me, something weirdly wired in me believes that in loving my mother, I need to honor her life and somehow take this pain that she had and somehow my honoring of her includes keeping it, keeping it. Maybe there's a thought, I'll fix it, I'll heal it, or I, I, there's not, but, but, but to be honest, there's no thought about it. There's like, all the thoughts are like, let it go. You can, uh, da, da. But the emotion, I can't let this go until I realized, wait a minute, that's my mother's regrets. Maybe I'm using the wrong word. Maybe it's my mother's pain, but it's not mine. And so I have a new view of objects, uh, loved ones, uh, discarded objects, because they've left, they've moved on in many various ways. I have a different view of them now because I treasure and I love the person. I've brought these things into my life, but if they brought them pain, why am I holding on to it? It's not my pain. And let's be clear, she's on the other side. She's feeling no pain right now. She's not thinking about that object right now and that Christmas and her sobs. She's not thinking about that. She's moved on. She left it here. She moved on. Why did I carry it forward and keep it alive in my memory? I'm the one with the memory. I'm the one with the memory. It's not my memory. So one aspect of ways that we've got piles and stuff that like this first little step that's setting me free is by, as I look at the things in my world, let me get clear. Let me get clear. This isn't mine. I took it on, but this isn't mine. There was a project way back with Religious Science International that I was given, well, actually, that was presented to me. Would you like to do this project? And this is what they said. Different people have had this project and they haven't been able to get it done. Are you interested in this project? And I said, yes, I love the idea of this project. I want to get it done. This is important. This is valuable. This will really contribute a lot to the world and to the children in the world. And I love, I love the whole thing. I love the whole, I, I would love to do it. And I've got the skills to do it. I can do it. I didn't do it. I still have the project. <laughs> now, Several other people, somebody had this great idea, here's this project, several other people tried to do it, they didn't do it, they acknowledged it and let it go. But no, when it gets into my world, it lives forever. Undone, undone, undone. Causing who? Me, angst. Because I got a pile of paper and I got a project and it's on my unconscious list of things I got to do. But it's buried right now in the boxes in my house. So I'm not reminded of it. So it doesn't exist to me, I think. 
except for just now when I just started giving this talk, just now it came up into me. Oh yeah, there's that project too. And so where is the memory and the thought and the beliefs about this project living in my world? It's in my consciousness and it's in my body. It is in my physical body. Some place in my body is a little pile of clogged whatnot. Just full of regret. Getting in the way and causing me maybe not to be able to bend my knees or pull on my oars or breathe as deeply as I like. Who knows where it's showing up, but somehow it's in me limiting my forward movement. And so here is one of the quotes that I've been living by, right? Again, Lloyd Straw, Marcia Sutton. Incomplete endings inhibit new beginnings. And here I am surrounded with incomplete endings. I'm just realizing it, right? Because when you move, some of you are about to move, you have moved, when your house is flooded, when the office is flooded, when uh, someone moves in and you gotta make space, you go through your stuff. And it's, if you've had the experience of going through some old stuff, you'll notice that it drains you as you're going through it. And you can't do more, for me, I can't do more than two hours of going through stuff, because I'm like, uh, you know, I'm just like ready to take a nap, and I do. Uh, because what you're going through is this incomplete stuff. Look, the divine mind says, I am that I am. Always in the now, always present, always current. The divine never carries a backlog. And yet, human beings carries a backlog. So it's added weight. So it's going to be. It's in our body. It's in our lives. It's in our thoughts. It's the, that weight that we're carrying that causes us not to be clear about what to do now. Because it's just, it, it's a bunch of fog in us. It's, it, the, the, the regrets and the pain and the suffering of relationships of the past that are, you know, in the heart causes you to have issues when you're trying to love and open up and, and really enjoy someone else, right? If you, um, if you have a bad thought, I was at a, oh God, the best party uh, last night. Uh, one of my dance classmates uh, decided to, uh, she and her husband decided to throw a joint uh, significant number birthday party. And they just had uh, dance music, nonstop, all the things that she loved. I don't know where, what her husband loved and all that, because I don't think it was his music, but she had her music. And we were dancing to it. And to every song that was played by the DJ had the word dance in it somehow, or party or something. And I was there with my dance classmates that the studio closed, this dance group no longer exists, and here we are. And I realized with this group, with this group, I'm complete. I'm complete in my relationships with them. We know who we are going forward. We know what our relations are going to be. I know what dances to me. I found that elsewhere. Others have found it in other places. Uh, but we're friends. We're still really good friends. And so we were a I, I was able to really enjoy myself. And I didn't have any of those little tugs in me. And so that's a sign you're complete. You're, you're current. My high school, I went to three different high schools. All three of them had reunions recently. And um, I thought about going to each and every one of them. And I decided not to. And I thought, why go? I'm going to end up feeling bad because it's filled with people that I'm incomplete about. I mean, high school, I mean, you had a lot of incomplete relationships there, right? You know, you were mad at this one, that one did that one to you, this one did that to you, that one rejected you, that one said something nasty to you, that one you said something nasty to. Ugh. Who wants to go back and dig all that up? So I didn't go, but it's there being carried by me. Going there or not going there would not have changed that, but going there 
would have made me even more aware of it. And again, how do you complete that which was undone in the past? And so realizing, first of all, spiritually, it doesn't, it doesn't exist now. It only exists because you're carrying it and you don't have to carry it. Okay, fine, that's the metaphysical uh, explanation, but you still got your heart who's like <laughs> And so I say spiritual practice sets me free. Yes, I'm doing the releasing prayer. That's working. I'm feeling with each time I do it, oh, I can breathe a little bit more. I feel a little bit more ready to give up more stuff. Haven't done it yet, but I'm a little bit more ready. Okay, fine. There's another spiritual practice, which is forgiveness. And whatever form of forgiveness, spiritual practice you've got, forgiveness is about the past, the past that you're carrying. And so whether it's the praising, raising prayer, which is, I praise you, Sarah, I raise you, Sarah, in the name of love, uh, or whether um, it's ho'oponopono, uh, I, I don't know the order of the words. Does anybody know the order of the four sentences off the top of their hands? I love you. I'm sorry, forgive me, thank you. Right. I love you. I'm sorry, forgive me, thank you, I love you. Is I love you last? Look it up. Ho'oponopono. Try to type that. Okay. Uh, so that's a really powerful practice. There's also spiritual mind treatment with that intention of knowing that divine love is there. And my favorite aunt. Um, she passed on a couple of weeks ago and I did that prayer uh, around her uh, with my family and friends and all those who were there which is you know we are complete we are complete and the love that I feel for you is what is eternal and so we'll meet again we will meet again and all is okay we're complete you can move forward free and clear of I will not tie you to this earth because of my need to finish and complete with you. I will let you go. So I declare myself to be complete with you. I have you in my heart. I can talk to you anytime I want, but I will be fine without you. And so you can move on. You're free. So I do that. Uh, prayer many times when I do a memorial but we can do we can do that uh, for anyone in our world that we feel incomplete about and whether we feel free yet or not even and then even if we do are filled with regrets or anger or any other kind of uh, attaching beliefs when we do spiritual practice we do the practices while we're feeling all of that and believing all that stuff and we're calling on God the divine to set us free of this stuff right forgiveness I don't know how to forgive Karen Karen I forgive you I don't know how to do that but grace is the descent of forgiveness I can set that intention to forgive and to be forgiven and then it's like magic I'm set free so I don't know if you're like me but spiritual practice is daily dedicated spiritual practice is valuable to keep us complete from our past Suze Ogden has sung a song to sing at the end of the day. Um, and I, I never, no matter how many times I've listened to it and tried to write down the words, I, none of it sticks with me except for the end, that I can now sleep knowing I have done my best. And so to keep current with our current days, given what I believe about myself, 
how I've evolved so far. I did the best that I could do this day. If I knew better, I would have done better, but I didn't. I declare this day complete. This is, this is all you had, God, and this is all you got. And if I made a mistake, didn't live up to what was intended, forgive me. And I've done my best. Let the day go. And then as you're guided, if you've got the debris, right? Expect the best and allow the creative process to silently clear away the debris of a disordered life. We think that's from Frederick Bales, but who knows? And in that disordered life is all the discarded incomplete business and its regrets and sadness and grief and sorrow and everything else that goes with that. Um, because we're meant to be here now, here now, fully alive, fully present and fully free for the good that is here for us now. That's what it's about. So I'm walking my talk and today I was talking my walk and uh, I'm sure the talk could have been better, but oh well, I did my best and definitely my walking of the talk could be better, but oh well, forgive me, I'm doing my best. And yeah, step by step, freer, 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 facing the new day. And then the vitality that comes, and then the glimmers of the visions of the future and of possibilities begin to pop out and emerge. Yeah, a lot of life to live. There's a lot of life to live between today, right now, and when we meet again next Sunday. Who will you be when we meet again? Will I even be able to recognize you? All right. Having those thoughts? All right. Reverend Rich is ready to <laughs> sing something. I'm walking. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so this is our time for conscious giving. And I'm going to read this. Yeah, I was hoping it didn't. Siri didn't talk back to you, darling. And uh, Mary is going to pass around the, the plate, and I'm going to read these words of wisdom. We do not give because God needs the gift, but because the giving increases, broadens, and deepens the life of the giver. Nor shall we give from the standpoint of duty. The universe refuses to bargain with us. It already has given us everything it has, but it also has provided that the gift of life can, re, can be received in its fullness only as it flows through us to the fullness of others. This is the law of giving and receiving by Deepak Chopra. I will make a commitment to keep wealth circulating in my life by giving and receiving life's most precious gifts, gifts of caring, affection, appreciation, and love. Each time I meet someone I will silently wish them happiness, joy, and laughter.
How wonderful it is that this exact balance which God and nature keep, how perfect is the law of good and how glorious the opportunity to join with the infinite giver in the givenness of the self to the joy of life. So, this word is being spoken for each one. There is only one life, and that life is God's life, and that life is here now. God is fully present. I am that I am here now. That is the only one reality, the reality of each one. And so all stuckness, or attachment to that which does not belong to the now ah, is all loosened, forgiven, released. Each one is breathing freer. Each one is more able to be here now, fully present, fully with those that he or she is with right now, fully in this now moment, which is always the threshold of new creative activities. And so each one is fully present and feeling all the qualities of the divine in a deeper, richer, fuller, more complete way than ever before because there is no stuck spot in anyone. Nothing in the past is good enough for anyone here and now. Each one is now present and receiving and accepting the abundant good of the now, here. And this is the truth. I am grateful that this is the truth. Yes, that's the consciousness of each one now. I release this word to the law, demanding that it make that so, and so it is. And that's the way it is. <laughs> So it is the day. So it is. 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 Make it so, God. Make it so. Make it so. And so it is. Thank you all for joining. Watch the bridge. Leo. Leo Doran said, watch the bridge. Add more to that. I don't know what you mean, watch the bridge. You mean the movie, the bridge? Is that what he means? The movie? Watch the bridge. Or does he mean, you're going to trip, honey. Be careful. <laughs> I don't know. All right. And Raul, good to see you. And Laura from Italy. Uh, Jossie Quince, by the way. Regina, your, your, your child said hello. All right. There we go. See you all next week. Bye-bye.